welcome to the first episode of a multi-part series, Learning Godot. We'll be using Godot 3.4. My name is Robert from Arc Spark Games. Uh, I'm one of the developers for our channel. Um, we do game development, game play videos, um, focusing around the Godot engine. Uh, I'm relatively new to Godot myself, um, so I figured what better way than um, practicing through some of their uh, tutorials online to learn to know myself um, and I figured it'd be a great way to interact and um, hopefully help some other folks out uh, learn to know along with me so with no further ado let's get started um, so the page for Godot is godotengine.org uh, that'll take you to the main landing page here uh, first thing we got to do is download Godot so right here you have download link we'll go ahead and click that um, you have different versions available. Uh, we'll be using the standard 64-bit version. If you're not sure, please look it up. We have that right here. Okay, now that that's downloaded, we have Godot version 3.4 stable, win64.exe.zip. Uh, if you open that up, you see the game engine right here. We can right-click that, um, copy it to. I usually just put it directly on my desktop, um, paste it here. In my case, I already have Godot installed. It's not really installed, it's just an executable that sits there, but we can replace it there on the desktop. Uh, overwrite it. Wait for that to finish up. And out of habit, I like pinning everything. I've pinned a bunch of stuff down on my taskbar, as you'll see here. I already have uh, Godot pinned. Um, so let's go ahead and fire it up and take a look at it. See, it opens a console here and the main project manager. Um, See, it says you currently do not have any projects. Would you like to explore the official example projects in the asset library? Uh, we'll just hit cancel. Um, let's go ahead and minimize uh, the console here, and we will minimize the uh, project manager. Um, so, back on your Godot web page, let's go ahead and click learn. What I'm going to do is Getting started, step by step. Expand that. Um, <clears throat> so Godot has their step by step instructions. You see, we have an introduction to the editor, uh, learning about scenes and nodes, instancing, and continued scripting signals. Your first game. Um, so I would highly, highly recommend um, reading over the introduction to editor, scenes and nodes. Godot is scene based. Um, it becomes a hierarchy. You have a scene and nodes attached to that scene, and then nodes attached to nodes uh, in that hierarchy form. Um, and that is crucial. Understanding that's crucial to game development in Godot. Um, then instancing, uh, scripting, signals. Um, all those very important reads start there before you continue with this video. Um, at least skim over it to kind of get an idea of what it's talking about when it's referring to some of these things. Uh, we'll start with your first game. Um, so your first game, this tutorial will guide you through making your first Godot project. You will learn how the Godot editor works, how to structure a project, and how to build a 2D game. Uh, this project is an introduction to the Godot engine. It assumes you have some programming experience already. Check. Uh, if you're new to programming entirely, you should start here. And it points you to the scripting. Uh, if you want to use c and Godot, please also read the C-Sharp basics, basics before continuing. Um, GD script is the native script language for to go. We won't be doing any C sharp. Um, so we'll continue on from there. So the first game they give you is called Dodge the Creeps. You can see uh, the example right here on my screen. Uh, very simple game. Uh, let's say you're this little guy right here. You just dodge all these creeps. Uh, so starting out 2D games. 2D games are easy. That's why Godot has you start with that. 3D games require a lot more in-depth knowledge about game design um, that I definitely don't have yet myself. So 2D games is where we will start. Uh, for this tutorial, we'll uh, assume you're familiar with the Godot editor. Um, I am a little bit familiar. Like I said, if you're not, go back and read the uh, editor overview prior to starting. So I'm going to move this project setup over temporarily to my other screen. Uh, Fire back up our Godot editor, or open it back up here. 
Um, so actually, let's do it like this for the time being, so y'all can follow along with me. Uh, let's see. Project setup. Launch Godot and create a new project, then download dodgeassets.zip. You can do that simply by clicking this link, and we will download it right here. Um, so this game is designed to run in portrait mode. Um, so we need to adjust the size of the game window. Click on project, project settings, display window. Let's see. Oh, we skipped a step already, so let's back up. So project setup, launch Godot and create a new project. So right over here on this right hand pane, we'll click new project. Uh, we'll title this project YouTube Tutorial. Um, and I'm just going to store it right here in my documents folder. You notice it says, please choose an empty folder. Um, so it has a default path here. Uh, in my case, see robber documents or robber uh, because I can't spell. Um, and you have the option to choose your renderer. So the renderer, we don't really have to worry about too much right now. We're going to leave it at OpenGLS 3.0, which is by default. Uh, we're going to leave the uh, project path by default right here, um, but the project name doesn't exist. So what we want to do is click Create Folder. And you notice we have this green little check mark now and the path actually exists, YouTube tutorial. Um, so we'll click create and edit. And that is going to open up our Godot engine editor. And you'll notice top right here it says YouTube tutorial because that's the project we are working on. So I'll pin this. And we're from right here. So um, we already downloaded our Dodge assets. As all of our assets and says unzip these files in your project folder. So let's show these in folder. Go ahead and open up our Dodge assets. Let's just do exactly what it says here. So we'll extract, extract to, and then we'll cut this. And Let's see, what is that? Documents. We find our YouTube tutorial folder and we will paste those right there. Okay. So from there, the we've unzipped the files into our project folder. Um, okay. So back to where we were. This game is designed for portrait mode, so we need to adjust the size of the game window. Click on project, project settings, display, window set width to 480 and height to 720. So let's do that. We have project, excuse me, project settings. And we have, what was it? Project, project settings, display, window, and let's see, width and height is right here at the top. Um, so our width we said was going to be 480 wide. Uh, so 480 pixels and our height, uh, what do we say? 720 pixels. Uh, let's see, so this step is done. Also in this section, um, see under the stretch option, set mode to 2D and aspect to keep. Uh, so that is still under display. Uh, let's see, we'll just kind of scroll down here. I think it's a little bit further. Here we go. Stretch at the very bottom mode. Um, we'll say 2D because we are making a 2D game, so we'll put it in 2D. Uh, aspect is to keep, and that will maintain our aspect ratio. Uh, let's see. Organizing the project. Okay, so we're done with this, so we can go ahead and close the general settings on our uh, project here. Next up, we have uh, organizing our project. In this project, we'll make three independent scenes, player, mob, HUD, which we'll, we will combine into the main scene. In a larger project, you might find it useful to create subfolders to hold the various scenes and their scripts. But for this relatively small game, you can save your scenes and scripts in the project's root folder identified by res slash slash. Uh, you can see your project folders in the file system doc in the lower left corner. 
Um, that is this pane right here, the file system dock, lower left pane. Uh, and you'll see res, you see the Dodge assets folder we put in here. Uh, we have this default environment.tres file and Godot icon.pmpg. Um, and what it's saying is pretty much if we had a very large project, you might um, divide up your uh, assets and script files so you could have something like uh, main. Well, let's do the rock camel case. Let's do main world. Okay. And then inside this folder, you would have all your nodes for your main world. Um, but in this case, the project is so small, we really don't need to uh, divide all that up in that level of complication. But that is something you definitely want to consider for larger projects. Uh, let's go ahead and remove that. Um, let's see, so player scene. The first scene will define the player object. One of the benefits of creating a separate player scene is that we can test it separately even before we've created other parts of the game. Uh, node structure. To begin with, we need to choose a root node for the player object. As a general rule, a scene's root node should reflect the object's desired functionality, what the object is. In other words, click the other node button and add an area 2D node to the scene. Um, so that's referring up to your left pane here. We're going to click other node and we want to add an area 2D. Uh, here it is. So under node 2D, you can see you can find it. So when you cre click uh, create new node, let's do that one more time. If you have a 2D scene, it automatically creates this 2D scene for you. Let's delete that. Um, and so you have to choose a root node. And in our case, we clicked other. Uh, we have this nice little search menu that shows up here. And we want that area to E, and you see that's under node campus item further down this hierarchy. So area 2D, we'll click create. Um, you'll notice a couple of things. You have this little eye here that means visible, not visible. Uh, you may be able to see it here on the screen. Um, and then you have this little warning triangle. Uh, they address that a little bit lower in the tutorial, so we'll talk about that in a moment. So let's see. All right, Godot. Okay, yep. Talking about the warning triangle. With the area 2D, we can detect objects that overlap or run into the player. Change the node's name to player by double clicking on it now. So let's do that. Let's double click our area 2D and we'll say player. All right. Um, before we add any children, uh, oh, let's back up a little bit. So now that we've set the scene's root node, we can add additional nodes to give it more functionality. So that's our root node, and we'll be adding additional nodes to it to expand on that node's functionality. Um, one interesting thing here, if I right-click that, let's see, we can do open documentation, and this will tell us all about the Area 2D class um, that we created when we made that node here. And it says 2D area for detection and physics and audio influence. 2D area that detects collision objects, 2D nodes overlapping, entering, or exiting can also alter or override local physical physics parameters, gravity, dampening, and route to audio to a custom and route audio to a custom audio bus. Um, and there's the properties, methods, signals, everything that has to do with that. Um, so that's a useful feature. Anytime you don't know what something is, oops, let's uh, cancel that and we'll close this. Uh, nope, we don't want to do that. Let's see. I'm not sure how to get rid of that at some. That's fine. Uh, so we have a player node. Let's go ahead and pin this back over to the side. And. So before we add any children, we want to make sure we don't accidentally move or resize them by clicking on them. Select the node, select the icon to the right, uh, icon to the right of the lock. Uh, it's tool tip, it's, it's tool tip, tool, 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 tool tip says make sure the object's children are not selectable. So we have our node selected, we don't want to rename it. Oh, there we go. Uh, and to the right of the lock, where is that? There's the lock and this little icon right here in your center pane. 
makes sure the object's children are not selectable. So that's what we want to click. Um, so that's this object. And we want to make sure that the children of that object we cannot click on when we're in the setting window here. Um, there's an example of that. Um, next up, it says save. So can't get over or can't stress this enough. You do not want to be working halfway through a project and Godot crash or computer crash and like that. So make sure you save. Make sure you save frequently. Uh, you'll see I hit Control S here. Uh, automatically this save scene as so that's what we've started our scene player um, and it automatically named it player with the extension dot tscn uh, I'm not sure what the t is something scene uh, so we'll just click save and now in our res folder our project folder you can see it we have our player scene and it has this uh, I don't know what that's called a little clack clack thing uh, there let's see so for this project, we'll use the following Godot naming conventions. Uh, GD script classes, nodes, use Pascal case. Uh, variables, functions, use snake case. That's underscores. Constants use all caps. That's pretty normal. And uh, we're not worried about the C-sharp portion. We want to create the animated sprite. Uh, node that's going to be a child of our player node so we'll right click we'll select right click on our player node click add child node uh, so I can type it for me but we'll type it out again animated sprite there it is click create we have our little triangle warning right here uh, node configuration warning a sprite frames resource must be created or set in the frames property in order for an animated sprite to display frames. So let's maximize our screen here. Uh, we'll see on the right hand pane here our inspector. Um, we have player selected. If we selected, or excuse me, we have animated sprite selected. We had player selected. The options are a little bit different, but we are working on the animated sprite node. Um, it, the tutorial tells us that and our triangle tells us that we need to create a sprite frames resource and that's here under frames you'll notice it's empty and so what we need to say is new sprite frames we'll click that we'll select it and click it one more time and we have this nice uh window uh this pane this animations pane that opens up on the bottom uh, let's go ahead and pin our project manager over here uh, so, find the frames property in the inspector. Click empty. Okay, that's what we just did. On the left is a list of animations. Click the default one and rename it to one. So, right here on this bottom pane, center bottom pane, uh, on the left hand side of it, we have animations and we have this new animation button, uh, trash can. So anything, if we're going to click new, we'll see we get a new animation. Um, if we want to delete this one, we just click the trash can and it'll give us a confirmation dialog. We'll click OK. Um, so for, per our tutorial, we're going to select default and we want to rename it. So we'll double click it um, and we're going to rename this to walk. Then we'll go click the new animation button right here next to the left of the trash can. And the next animation, you see it created a new anim. Uh, modify that and call it up. And then it says find the player images in the file system tab. They're in the alt art folder you unzipped earlier. Drag the two images for each animation named player gray up one and two, then player gray walk one and two into the animation frames. Um, so here's a Dodge Assets. We'll open this. We see our art folder. And uh, go ahead and expand this. We'll have a little bit more space. Scroll through here. So we have player gray up one. We're going to add these in order. So we have our up animation. Uh, we're going to add it over here. And there's one up. And then we're going to add player gray up two. And you notice um, that it has indexed them. So you see zero colon, one colon, 
Um, so that's animation. The animation is called up, and that's animation part one, animation part two, text. Um, we'll select walk, and then we'll do walk one, which ends up being index zero. And then player gray walk two, which will be indexed at one. Let's bring this back over to the right. Let's see into the animation frame side. That's what we just did. Uh, the player images are a bit too large for the game window, so we need to scale them down. Uh, click on the animated sprite node and set the scale property to 0.5 x 0.5 y. Uh, you can find it in the inspector under node 2D heading. Okay, that was a mouthful. So player images are a bit too large for the window. We need to scale them down. Click the animated sprite node. So we have the animated sprite node selected. Uh, we'll click it. Uh, and let's make this full screen again. And we will scroll. Let's see. Transform. Scale. Here we have the default of 1x, uh, default of 1y, and so we're going to scale those down to 0 0.5, 0 0.5. And you notice over here in our viewport, um, the shape of our player 1 has changed. There we go. So animated sprite, node 2D, transform, and then scale. Okay, we've scaled our image uh, right here under our Node 2D transform scale. Next thing we want to do um, is add the collision shape 2D as a child of the player node. This will determine the player's hitbox or the bounds of its collision area. For this character, a capsule shape 2D. So first, um, keep in mind we have our scene. We're going to select player. And then we want to add the um, collision 2D shape. So we're going to add a child node. And let's we'll search collision, collision shape 2D. I think I said collision 2D shape. Collision shape 2D is what we want. We're going to click create. Um, and now you can see the collision shape 2D is part of the player node, um, not of the animated sprite, child of the player. Uh, let's see. So we're going to use a capsule shape 2D node that gives the best fit. Um, so you notice over here in your inspector, let's go ahead and make this full screen. We have our collision shape detected. And right here in our inspector, we have empty. Uh, we're going to say new capsule shape 2D. And right here in our viewport and our center screen, let's use our mouse wheel to zoom in. So we'll zoom in right there, and we have this uh, nice little blue capsule shape right here. So what we want to do is fit this capsule around our player. Um, so uh, this tutorial is pretty much having you create this coll collision area, um, and it's having you do the entire uh, the entire player. So let's go ahead and ex grab this little red dot here, and we'll pull it up. And we don't want it to exceed the bounds of our player. Let's see, we can drop one more notch. That's fine. And let's open this up. Oh, and we're a little bit too big. Let's see. Control Z is your friend. All right, there we go. And so let's uh, scale this back a little bit. Open it up some more let's go ahead and open it up all the way on what we want to do is grab this right one first and open it all the way to the right and then grab our top one and pull it down and we should cover our player very very nicely here so you can see we got a little bit of player exposed but that's not a big deal uh, let's pin back right this is using the two size handles reshaped size which is what we just did uh, once we are finished your player node should look like this. And let's see, so on our scene, we have player, that's right. 
Um, no more triangle. We have our animated sprite, which is a child of player. You can see the little hierarchy lines here. And then we have our collision shape 2D. Uh, so it's prompting us. Let's go ahead and just save again where we are. Control S. And the next step we have is now we want to add some functionality so that we can get that we can't get in can't get from a built-in node. So we have to add a script. Um, so pretty much the next point here, we're going to be building our script that helps control our player node. Um, so you'll notice right here we have player. We'll select that. And then we have this little icon saying our children are not selectable. Let's right click and you will see attach script. So let's go ahead and click that. And it'll tell you the language that we're going to be using is GD script. Um, it's going to be inheriting 2D. Um, so that's your uh, class that you'll be inheriting. Uh, the template is going to be default. And the path is our generic project path, uh, which is res colon slash slash. And it's going to create player dot GD. GD. So player uh, GD script. And we'll just click create. And so let's go ahead and I'm going to move my instructions over to my other monitor here so I can open up the uh, project manager in full screen. Um, so you'll see uh, we have our player node selected. We have this tab open here. We're working on the player.gd script. Uh, it's extending this area 2D. We have some comments. Uh, we have a default function here called ready and another function called process delta that's been commented out. Um, so let's go ahead and start doing this. Um, so it gives you some examples here. Um, we're going to head and delete these three commented lines. Uh, Godot doesn't support multi-line comments. Your comments are marked with this uh, pound sign or hashtag. Um, so let's go ahead and delete those top three comments. And what we're going to be doing is creating a variable uh, called speed. And for that variable, we're going to use the keyword export. Um, so in GD script, um, Python as well, you would normally declare a variable by stating var space, the variable name, in which case it's going to be speed. And it's prompting us to create the speed uh, variable, we're going to initialize that variable at 400. Um, and then let's go ahead and put this comment in here. How fast the player will move. And that is in pixels over seconds. So pixels per second. And we're going to use the export keyword. So keywords for variables are special modifiers that go on the left hand side of the word var so we'll put a space in um, to the left of var click over one and we'll say export and so that's our keyword export and then we have our variable declaration and initialization all here on one line and so what that's going to do for us if we come back over to the left and click our player node uh, you'll see script variables and there's our speed variables and it has the default value that we initialized to which is 400 um, and why they had you do this it's very convenient for you to have um, your default variables defined but you can override it here so we can say 200 so we're slowing our character down um, but if we look at the script by clicking the little script thing here, you notice our speed is still actually 400, but we overrode that value. Um, so that, that's kind of a nifty thing uh, using that export uh, modifier there. Uh, so the next thing we want to do, uh, variable, is we're going to create the screen size. Uh, so let's hit the return key and we'll say var because we're defining a variable screen underscore size and we are not going to initialize that we're just uh, declaring the variable and we'll put the comment here this is size 
the size of the game window. Uh, period. Let's make it nice and pretty. Uh, I'm always conflicted personally. Should I put periods in my comments? Should I write it? How, how correct should my grammar be? Um, I usually wouldn't put a period in there. Um, but anyway, let's continue. So um, we've defined these two variables. And it's telling us, hey, now that we've got that export here, like I said, we can click player. There it is. Speed, which you notice we have it overridden. Uh, we can click undo, and we'll put it back to its default value. Uh, next step. Let's see. So let's go back to our script by clicking this little script icon here next to our player node. And our tutorial says... The underscore ready function is called when a node's when a node enters the scene tree, which is a good time to find the size of the game window. So what that means is you have your scene here, and you can think of this as like your empty tree. And so then you have this player node and it's entering into the scene. And when it does that, we can call the ready function because the node should be ready. Um, and it's telling us it'd be a great time to find the size of our window. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll uh, get rid of this pass uh, print here. Uh, let's remove that. And let's say we'll say our variable screen size, and we can just tab that out, say equals, and then we're going to run the function get underscore viewport underscore rect, so rectangle, and then we're going to access the property size and do period and type SI, you notice it populates it for us, so we just tap that out. So now we can use the underscore process function to define what the player will do. So that's this next chunk down here, this function process, and they're passing the uh, value of delta to it. And you notice that's commented out for the time being. Um, and you notice this comment up here says function underscore, or excuse me, underscore process is called every frame. Delta is the elapsed time since the previous frame. Uh, so let's go ahead and uncomment that function. And we'll uncomment that line and go ahead and just get rid of pass. And return. And so um, our tutorial. We've done our screen size. Um, it's telling us about the process function. It's telling us how it works. Let's scroll down. And it says you can detect whether a key is depressed using input dot is action underscore or excuse me, input dot is underscore action underscore pressed. Um, so we'll use this function here. To figure out if something is pressed and that returns a boolean so it's either going to be true or false um, and we're passing looks like the string values of ui right ui left ui down ui up and that's actually going to be your directional arrows um, so this is what our function is supposed to look like func underscore process passing parameter delta and then we're going to define a new variable called velocity and we're going to create an instance of the class vector2 um, and that's going to be the player's movement vector. Um, Godot does have um, some tutorials on basic vector math if you're not familiar. Um, I read a couple of them, I found it a little helpful. Math is definitely not my strong point. Um, you don't need a deep understanding of vector math to be able to work with some of these scripts, but it definitely helps. Um, so I would recommend that if you have time. Uh, moving our tutorial over, let's go ahead and start uh, writing our function. Um, I find it helpful to actually type this stuff out 
and think about what you're typing out and think about you know what each command is doing um, i could just simply and copy and paste uh, this stuff in uh, just like that um, but that doesn't really teach me anything it doesn't teach me um, i don't get that muscle memory that um, i don't remember uh, what I've done or what is actually happening. So I'm going to type all this stuff out manually. So let's go ahead and do that. Alright, so we have our variable velocity, which is an instance of the vector class. Um, if we want to know what this is, we can actually highlight vector like this, I believe. Uh, actually, search help. That's what we want to do right here. And we'll say vector 2d. Uh, vector 2, excuse me, not vector 2d. And you'll notice right here we have the class vector 2 and then the function vector 2. And it looks like we're actually, or the method, excuse me. So we'll click that and that constructs a new vector 2 from a given x and y. Um, and you notice we're not actually passing an x or y to it, um, we're leaving it blank. And so let's close this help. And so when we create our velocity, we're creating a new vector two x y coordinates. I'm gonna spell players here. There we go. And then we have our first in if statements. We're saying if input is action press. So input and the method we're using is action press, and we're saying UI right, which is right on our mouse button. Uh, we will be setting the velocity, so velocity, which we just defined, velocity, and we're going to say, um, if we look to this vector 2, it's for an x and y coordinate, so a property of our new velocity variables will be dot x. Uh, we'll say plus equals. Um, so we're adding to the current velocity and setting it equal to 1. And let's see, I forgot, I already have a syntax here. here. So your ifs in GDScript should end with a colon and enter, and you notice it automatically tabbed over for me. And so let's end this, and we'll go to our next if statement. We'll say if input dot is underscore action action pressed and we're just tabbing this stuff out and the next one it wants us to do is ui left there we go ui left let's say parenthesis there we'll do our colon enter it automatically indented for us and we'll say velocity dot x minus equals one. So we're saying right now, if the input action pressed right, we're going to add one to the current velocity. Um, if action pressed UI left, we're going to subtract one from the current velocity. Um, so I like to make extra comments. So let's put some space between var velocity and these commands right here. So we'll do a comment and we'll say left and right player movement. All right. And then we'll do a little space here and we'll say 
up and down player movement. This will be if input dot is underscore action pressed and UI down close colon return and for UI down we'll say velocity dot y because we're going up and down on the y axis now versus your x axis is running left to right um, so velocity y we're going down and it's actually um, backwards so in this case it'd be plus equals one so normally you think about let's look at our uh, our x and y axis here you have your x axis which is this uh, it's red on the left purple on the right and right here in the center point that's your origin so in this case going to the right is increasing on your x axis so if you think of the number line you know one two three four and going on forever um, and then the opposite direction that's going to be a negative number um, so negative one negative two negative three so on. Um, now your y-axis most of us would assume that this would be one two three four but it's actually negative one negative two negative three negative four and then going down we have one two three four um, and so that's why we have this on our um, code here we actually have ui down so we're pushing the down key we're actually increasing our y vector uh, or y coordinate and not decreasing it um, and the last one we need to code here is if input dot is action pressed and we'll say ui this will be our up ui up close colon enter velocity dot y minus equals one uh, so we now have uh, code to handle our left and right movement and code to handle our up and down movement uh, next thing we need to do for our code example here so we want to say if velocity dot length is greater than zero colon enter velocity equals velocity dot normalized normalized and that's a function times speed and our variable speed so um this gets back into the vector math here uh and i'm not going to go into too much of the detail for it so in old games they didn't have a correction for this but if you're moving up you're moving at a constant speed. If you're moving down, you're moving at a constant speed. Left, same thing. Right, same thing. But if you're moving at an angle, you will end up actually moving faster. And so what this normalized function here, um, when we multiply it by our speed, it actually takes the uh, length of our vector, vector coordinates, and normalizes it. Um, so if it's greater than zero, it'll fix it. So we move at a consistent speed when we're moving at angles. So if you're pushing up and right, you would move at the same speed as if you were just pushing up or you were just pushing right. And that's what it's doing for us. Uh, we got two more little bits here. Uh, so right here, uh, let's see. So if we're moving, which our length is greater than zero, we also want to play our animation. So this has this dollar animated sprite. So this dollar, dollar symbol right here, that allows us to access our nodes on the left hand uh, pane over here under the scene. So we say 
dollar. Uh, dollar collision shape 2D. Yes, so this dollar symbol allows us to access not all the nodes, but all the children of the player scene because we're editing the script for the player. So by using that dollar, we can access all the children nodes of it. Um, but we don't want collision, we want animated sprite. And then a function of animated sprite is going to be dot play. All right. And we can see that. So let's click our animated sprite here. And let's see, open documentation. And so we'll right click on that. That's a sprite node that can be used for multiple textures, sprite node that can use multiple textures for animation. And we can scroll down looking at the uh, properties and then methods here and you see play is one of the methods and you can pass a string um, or it looks like backwards boolean uh, to it also. So let's keep scrolling down. Let's look at the play method. So void play, the return type is void. We don't return anything. Play is the animation named anim. Um, so anim, whatever our string value is. If no anim is provided, the current animation is played. If backwards is true, the animation will be played in reverse. Um, so once again, I recommend as you're typing all these functions out to actually go and read about them. It'll help you have a much better understanding of what you're actually coding here. So let's uh, select our player node again. We'll click our script and we see uh, this animated sprite. And right now we're going to leave it blank for play. And we'll hit return and we're going to do it else, colon. And say animated sprite again, not stop. So we're stopping the play of the animation. All right, so let's go ahead and hit control S because we just typed a whole lot. Um, and let's add another comment in here actually. So this will normalize movement speed. We'll call it movement speed. Um, and we'll say comma play animation and play animation and let's go ahead and just save that one more time so we have nice little comments in here telling us what every little piece does very very important if you really want to understand your code uh, especially when you're going through these tutorials it'll make a big difference and you'll thank yourself later because you'll be able to remember actually what you were doing uh, so let's swing back to our tutorial page right here uh, let's see, it gives you a brief rundown of everything you just typed. So we start by setting the velocity to zero, zero. Uh, by default, the player should not be moving. Then we check each input and subtract from the velocity to obtain a total direction. For example, we will write down at the same time resulting velocity, ve uh, the resulting velocity vector will be one, one. In this case, since we're adding a horizontal and vertical movement, the player will move faster diagonally than if it just moved horizontally. And that's where this normalized um, uh, function comes in here. Uh, and actually, here's where it talks about vector math. You want a refresher, and you can click the link here. This is vector math. Uh, let's keep going through our tutorial here. We also check whether the player is moving, so we can call play or stop on the animated sprite. Uh, dollar is shorthand for git node, um, so when you type that dollar, you're actually using git underscore node. Uh, so in the code above, dollar animated sprite is the same as git underscore node passing animated sprite node dot play. See in GD script, dollar returns the node at the relative path from the current node. Our current node, remember in this case, is player. So back over here, so our current node is player for this script, and we use that dollar. It's looking relative to the player node. Let's flip back over. Um, now that we have a movement and direction, we can update the player's position. We can also use the clamp feature 
uh, or clamp function to prevent it from leaving the screen. Clamping is a value. Clamping a value means restricting it to a given range. Um, add the following to the bottom of the underscore process function and make sure it's not indented under the else. Um, so before we do that, let's go ahead and look at what we have. So we created our GD script for our player node. Uh, we can click around. We have these two um, children nodes of the player node we created. And let's go ahead and you see on the top right, upper hand right of the uh, Godot engine here, we'll hit play. And it's gonna say no main scene has ever been defined. Select one, you can change it later in the project settings under the application category. So we're just gonna click select current. And let's see. So here is our window uh, that we initially set our sizes. So what was that for? Uh, something by 720. I'll go scroll back up and find it. Um, you can go back and reference it if you want. There we go. So we're going to use our arrow keys to actually control our character. And you notice right now I can hit these buttons. It's playing, but it's not actually moving my character's position on the screen. But the animation is playing when I hit up. Down, left, right. And it looks to be all playing the same animation. So let's go ahead and close this debug window. And we'll pop back over to our script here and we'll continue coding. Uh, so the next thing we want to do is calculate our actual position. So let's go ahead and do that piece real quick. This is going to actually position our sprite on the game screen. So we'll say position plus equals velocity times delta. Right, let's go ahead and pull S again. Oh, pull S again here, and let's go ahead and play this one more time. Right, um, so now you'll see we actually have movement from our player sprite. We go down, we do a dance, we go up, we have that same animation. But um, the next issue we have the most we can go off the screen and infinitely. It just keeps going either left or right. I don't know how far I went. I just held the button down. Oh, there we go. So we need to fix that. We don't want our player to travel out of the bounds of the screen. Uh, so let's go ahead and close our debugger. And next thing we're going to do is these clamp functions. So we're going to clamp the position for X and clamp the position for Y by the screen size of X and Y. Uh, so let's go ahead and type that up. So give ourselves space. Oh, let's go ahead and make a comment here. Set position of player. Uh, so that's what our position plus equals velocity times delta is doing. And next thing, let's go ahead and make a comment. Clamp player position inside bounds of the screen. Alright, so we'll say position dot x equals clamp. Then inside the clamp we're going to pass the position dot x comma and you see our little tooltip here. So float is what we return. It returns a floating point number. Uh, clamp, we're going to pass float of x, uh, the minimum float, which we're going to use 0, and then the max float, which is going to be the x position of the screen. Uh, so let's go ahead and type for 0, comma, and our last parameters will be screen size dot x. And for this, what we're going to do is just copy and paste it, and we're going to update x with y. So we clamped our x position, and we'll just actually just go ahead and see what that looks like. So x, remember, is going to be your left and right axis. Oh, and we have an error. Um, let's see. 
So the identifier position is declared in the current. Oh, I misspelled position. Let's fix that. Save. Enable the right because player file should start lacking. Uh, oh, this is trying to run the script. So we stopped. And I updated the word position. Click save. And let's click play this time. There we go. Oh. Uh, did I misspell position? I did. Okay, I can't type. So another typo there, position. Uh, let's stop our script. I corrected our typo. So I misspelled it twice here. Uh, got fixed now. So let's try this one more time. There we go. So as we have our character, we can go up outside of the screen. And let's check this plant function. So let's go to the right. And you see we stop at the bounds of the right screen of the right side of the screen and on the left side of the screen now because we use that clamp function. So let's go ahead and do the Y positions. Um, and like I said, we'll just go copy line 40 here. And control V, and we'll just update this to position on Y, position on Y, on default is zero and screen size of dot Y. Let's control S again to save. Let's go ahead and run again. And now we have our movement. We're clamp left, clamp right, clamp up, and down on our Y axis. So perfect. So we made it this far. Uh, we're doing pretty good. We have our character, we have our animation, um, and we have. Um, our bounds for our character to find. Uh, so I think I'm going to end the video right here. Uh, I'm going to make a second one um, so we can just pick up right where we left off. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to watch. If you could, please hit that like button. It would mean a lot to me and mean a lot to the channel. Uh, if you're interested in watching more content, hit the subscribe button. And if you want notifications for every time we release a new video, hit that bell. Thank you. I'll see you again soon.